Hi everybody, how's it going? Um, so, um, why don't you guys take a seat? I'll, I'll do the middle thing and I'll, I'll look left and right. Uh, how many of you, just to get an idea, how many of you uh, know Blah Blah Car as a, as a company? Okay, so what is that? About a third of the audience. No, I'm kidding. Um, how many people have actually taken a ride share with Blah Blah Car? Awesome. Okay, how many people know Drivey? That's good, because he's, he's on stage. That'd be rude to say the other. How many people have rented a car on Drivey? That's cool. OK, that's getting bigger every time I ask. OK, awesome. So we're going to be talking about, uh, um, let's say, scaling up in, in multiple senses. We'll talk a little bit about the business sense, but really, we've been talking a lot about culture inside. So I, I think we'll talk a lot about that. Um, and, and so what is it like to scale up uh, a, a sharing economy, you know, company. We we talk a lot about. You guys are rolling out uh, very quickly. You're now everywhere from Mexico to India, so that's like an 18-hour time zone difference in total. So how do you manage that breadth? Um, it's a state of mind. I mean, the the only thing that uh, you have to keep in mind, and that all the team at Blah Blah Car is keeping in mind, is that the only constant is change. So the only thing we are sure about in the growth of the company is that it will change. So everybody has to be prepared for that. And uh, once you get this spirit in the team, uh, it helps a lot in getting adapted to the growth. Uh, two years ago, a bit more than two years ago, we were 60. And today, we are 300 people. Um, the most important thing is that the DNA doesn't change. So we've made a lot of efforts around that to build a DNA which is uh, centered around values. Uh, we've made the values, we've crowdsourced them from the team. So we were 60 when we actually wrote our values. It's a set of 10 values. It goes from fun and serious because they go together. And then another value is the member is the boss because we really care about the community. We have another value which is fail, learn, succeed, which states that failure is part of the learning process to succeed. Um, this kind of thing is uh, really important for the team to scale in a proper way. It's the DNA of the company, uh, it's uh, the energy, and then once you get that, then you just uh, make the same structure, but bigger, stronger, faster, more efficient, and, and that's what we all want. And, and, and so, d despite um, growing very quickly, and you guys are hiring a lot, right now. That's the one thing I hear all the time is blah, blah, car. Ah, yeah. May I say it oh, another okay. time? We are hiring. We are blah, blah, car. <laughs> but you guys are also known for having, uh, you guys are now notorious in the Paris scene for having a very rigorous, you guys have like 10 interviews that every candidate goes through, right? Is that, is that a lot? It's in between four and, t four and eight, I would say. Yeah, yeah okay, so 10 might, 10 might be the high end. And, and, and is that about making sure that every, that, is that assure the culture? Is that, is that a process, you know, is that necessary for you guys to have? A so th there are several steps. The first step is that you have to answer some questions about uh, the activity, about the job you're applying for and about uh, blah, blah, car. And then there is a review of CVs. And then if it works, there are online testing. So we send online testing to our candidates. And then if it works, there are some uh, uh, video interviews with you know tools which allow you to have video interviews from candidates without having to meet them uh, initially. So then uh, if, uh, and we ask questions as well. Uh, in this context, and so uh, then when you have that, there is a Skype interview. If the Skype interview goes well, then you're allowed to come and visit us and have a proper interview. And then there is a case interview, so you'll have to prepare for a case which uh, deals with actually a real business issue we're facing. And so it's two goals because this uh, interview, this case interview, is made for seeing if the candidate is fit for the job, but also. Uh, sometimes it helps us having some new ideas, so it's really good. Um, and so when you go through all those steps, we receive 5,000 resumes per month, about, and we recruit about 20 people, so we, it's a ratio of one out of 250. 
um, and we're super uh, we're, we're super exigent. Yes, uh, we we want people who really fit in the culture as well and who can do the job. But that's the only way you can grow. I mean, you can't lower the bar. I mean, we hire high. We're proud of that, and that's what we want to continue. And so. So, so blah blah cars sort of paved this way for this idea. I, I've talked a lot in the past few years about how I think that, I mean, it's no surprise that look at all the companies that are here coming to Paris to talk about the sharing economy. If you look at the head of Europe of Airbnb, where do they come from? If you look at the head of Europe of Uber, who was just on stage, where do they come from? France does the sharing economy really well, and, and you guys have been a very great example of that. And recently, with your guys' most recent fundraising, I saw that you guys are now, is this true, the, the biggest car sharing uh, platform worldwide. Is that right? Am I wrong in saying that? Uh, I think you're right. <laughs> okay, good, I got that right. It would be terrible if I was wrong. Now, as you guys start to grow on top of that and, and continue to try to become a, a, at a larger scale, do you see yourself learning from best practices? Do you, do you have 10 uh, culture phrases in the company now? Do you have eight interviews? How, how do you... What are, what are sort of the best practices and do you see commonalities between how you guys try to scale up in, internally? So we are definitely not at the stage where everything is perfectly processed and everything, but we, we are really uh, trying, to, trying to, to, to get there. So now it's, uh, it's about 45 people. So definitely running a company with 45 people is very different from 10. Uh, What's, what's kind of the, the big challenge in scaling is that the energy and the, and the values, even though we didn't like formulate and print them, I, th I think it's, very, it's a, very, a very lively culture at Drivey. But then you, you cannot live only with that because when you have thousands of uh, customers and, uh, and tens of employees, uh, just the values and the energy does, isn't enough. And, and there is a lot about software. Even in, and for example, for recruitment, we are hiring an, a hiring manager. So that's the kind of thing that you have to do if you, if, if you want to have a good quality to the candidates. So f for example, the, the quality of our response to candidates applying at Drivey was declining because we were just uh, overwhelmed by, by the number of uh, applications. So now we are trying to organize that and that's obviously obviously true for every sector of the, of the company. And, and you guys are really at that stage where you really need to start putting in place processes. If you want to go from 45 to 100 or 150, or I'm sure there's some magical number in your head for the next couple of years, w what are the biggest things that keep you awake as, as, as a CEO? I mean, for me, it's still, uh, it's still the product. I mean, really product design, service design that, that really uh, keeps me awake. But, but definitely the setting up the, the, the right processes takes a lot of time and, and it's, a, it's a kind of distraction and if you are late, it, it eats even more of your time. And, and Fred, do those problems evolve? I mean, again, it was only two years ago that you were Poulon's the drive these sides. Do those problems change? Do you, do you still, are those problems worked out or do they just change form? How, how, do, you, how do you see your, the things keeping you awake changing from day to day as you guys go? From um, to yeah, it's true that you have to solve the problems one by one once you meet them. Uh, they may be different from one structure to the next. They may happen at different stages. Uh, there are some period of time where you focus on product, some periods of time where you focus on growth, some period of time where you focus on uh, satisfaction of the community. And so you, you have periods and then as long as you grow, you have people who are in charge of making sure that this will be repeated and so that uh, satisfaction of the community has become a priority and stays so, and then you focus on, uh, on product, on financing the, the entire structure, on building a, a global, um, a very international culture inside the company. Now we have 29 nationalities at BlaBlaCar, and this has changed a lot in the way we work as well, because uh, like uh, a long time ago, uh, we used to work in French, uh, and today we, we work with uh, English across the board in the company. It's really changing also the culture and everybody's feeling that BlaBlaCar is now a global company. It's not a French company. It's not even a European company. We are now in Mexico, in India, in Russia. Uh, so we're really becoming global and this culture has been evolving always with a willingness to make the best in all the fields we address, whether it's community, product uh, or communication. 
And uh, how do you how do you think you guys? Well, really quickly. Um, so it, lunch is going to come up just afterwards. So we're only going to have 15 more minutes. It's going to be a very quick. If you guys have questions, type them online. Uh, I'll shoot them up. Or if you'd rather just raise your hand and yell, raise your hand and yell, and I'll find you. Uh, I have I could talk with these guys all day, and I probably will. But if you have anything you want to ask, please jump in. It's collaborative. Let's do this together. Don't leave me hanging. Thank you. Um, I think something that most people would benefit from, there are a lot of people building uh, sharing economy platforms, I think from each of you, is what, are, what is a very concrete mistake that you've made? And how, do, how, did you, how long did it take you to identify it? And how did you fix it? And what, what, are those, what is that core thing where you're like, oh man, if I, if I had just known, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have lost six months? Yeah, that, that too, I would say for us. Uh, they, so the only mistakes which become failures are mistakes in which you persist. So as long as you realize that you've made a mistake, if you don't make it twice, three times, four times, ten times, you have a way out. Mm -hmm. But you have to make sure you realize that this is not the right way to do. So um, one of them was to maybe not change our brand, which was a French brand, uh, early enough. It was tough when we changed it, but it was really the nice thing to do because now when we're expanding and we're doing acquihires with new companies in new countries, we change the brand and we have a unified brand and this is a real power because uh, you can't grow with a brand which cannot cross borders. If you have to create new brands each time, it's a new marketing, it's new positioning, it's a new brand, it's too tough for all the teams because you don't know the positioning of the entire company. So the idea was really to unify the brand and if I, maybe I, we should have done it a bit earlier because the Blablacar brand is actually quite recent. It's not even three years old uh, uh, in, in most countries. And before that you guys had Three brands, three different. You uh, had the we, Spanish brand. We had Covatrage, we had Comuto, and then we, when what we did was um, when we acquired Posto in Auto, then Posto in Auto became Blablacar, and then in in Russia it was Podorozniki. We made it uh, Blablacar. Auto Hop is becoming Blablacar. Rides in Mexico is becoming Blablacar. So we have to unify the same brand everywhere. Uh, this is very crucial, and maybe if you guys want to create a company, it's good to think ahead of a good name that can scale with you. Uh, so that you don't have to change it afterwards because you've invested so much on your brand. And then the second mistake, I would say, but it was part of our growth as well because it was a way to finance ourselves at the, in the early days, was to actually believe that uh, the B2B activity for, uh, for ride sharing would help us grow. It was not that way, actually. Uh, we developed like 200 platforms for companies for many companies and administrations. And actually, uh, the traction and the usage weren't there. What we saw was that the usage was on the public platform for long distance ride sharing. It was not on short distance. And still, we were kind of stuck with uh, our clients paying us because it was the only way we could get some money to grow the team and grow the project. And maybe we should have uh, changed and pivoted earlier. Uh, we knew where well, we wanted to develop both. We wanted to develop short distance ride sharing like commuting for companies and we want to develop long distance ride sharing for the uh, all the, um, the, the, the everybody and like the consumers and so maybe it was too much we should have focused on only one but the problem we had was that the one that was working was not bringing any money it was costing a lot and the one that was not working was actually bringing some money so we had the B2B activity bringing in some money and the C2C activity, which was costing a lot. And, uh, but we should have That's focused changed on now. That is yeah, it has <laughs> changed. And now we've focused on C2C only. And we've found a business model that allows the company to grow on its core activity. And it's much, much better. And Poulin hasn't done this mistake. So <laughs> maybe you've learned from our mistake. There's no, there's no B2B driving. There's no exactly. You know, no B2B, no white label, no, no talking to, to cities for years. Uh, so we had that chance. The, 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 the name we did, the, we started with the same problem because we were called Voiturelib in the beginning and now it's Drivey. It was a nightmare to change the name so I can only recommend each time I see entrepreneurs asking for advice and with a, with a project with a bad name, I'm like, please <laughs> do something about it because then it's, it's going to be much more costly. Um, and then I'm back, back to hiring my... I guess my main mistake was, our main mistake was hiring too slow. Like, uh, 
hiring like the, the, the team is was always too too small and we should probably have uh, hired some uh, some very high profile candidates uh, earlier instead of doubting okay we'll hire people only when we are sure that uh, the uh, of the outcome of the activity and everything we should have taken more risk on, on that part and and now I think we will now you're moving faster right. yes um Great. Okay, we have a few questions from people, and actually, I really, I really like the first one from Christina. Um, do you guys? I, I've seen some people talk about this in the past, uh, starting startups as co-ops instead of as traditional businesses. How, how do you view that? Whether or not Blah Blah Car or Drivey would become a co-op, or maybe that's in the pipeline. But I'm, I'm not. I no, wait. Well, it's it. not in the pipeline. It's it's really interesting model. The thing is. Um, uh, we we have a, uh, something we say also internally sometimes is that uh, uh, when it works, don't fix it. So for now, the way we develop works. And you know, there are so many ways you could make things that don't work, that when you have something that works, uh, including on the financing part and like the way we grow today, it works, it's not broken. The day it's broken and the day we believe our model should adapt to whatever social change will do it. But for now, we have so many other things we have to make working that I don't want to break something that is already working. So it would take some sort of community. You, you would see that as being driven by the, the metrics that move yeah. your business. If the community said, we well, don't use blah, blah, car unless we own a piece of it, then that... Yeah, 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 that, yeah. If the community says we want to own a piece of it, yeah, we we'll listen to it. It's it you hasn't I, you raised. I mean, so far, no one has ever said that. I mean, a, 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 apart from when we are in gatherings uh, here, I've never heard that. So it's called an IPO, actually, an IPO. You could yeah. instead of, instead of getting the revenue of your ride, you could uh, buy shares uh, yeah. after an IPO. So. Exactly. And exactly, it's the IPO scheme but it's for more mature companies, it's for later on. And then there was, there was a second question, which might be a joke, so I might not ask it exactly as phrased. Um, but coming back to sh short distance, uh, have you guys looked into the idea? Right now you do what? It's a, a 150 to 1500 kilometers? Is that the number I saw recently? Yeah, the, uh, so the average distance is a bit more than 300 kilometers. So it's really long distance ride sharing. It's city to city ride sharing. Um, and the short distances, we've tried it and we've developed it with a B2B activity for commuting. So for distances of about uh, 10 to 30 kilometers, like people going to work every morning and, uh, and coming back from work every night. Um, it was a model that worked uh, when people had met because they were neighbors and they were going to the same place every day. But actually, the amount of money that people save that way is really small. It's big when you take it like all year long, but on a, on a one-shot basis, it's one or two or three euros. And if you want to develop that as an occasional activity where you'd have drivers offering their empty seats for trips which are 10 or, or 30 kilometers, uh, it's really small in amount. So if you take the price, for example, per kilometer, per kilometer for passengers on blah blah car, it's five to seven cents a kilometer. Which means um, if we compare, and that's also uh, something, if we compare to the other services which are intra-city, the models like Uber and everything, they cost like 20 to 50 times more per kilometer. So it's really uh, different because uh, we are in a cost-sharing space, which means our driver don't make any profit at all. They are actually losing money on the trip because at five or seven cents a kilometer, it's really small. So if you do 10 kilometers, it's 50 cents. The thing is, for sharing 50 cents and possibly having to pick up someone anywhere in the city and bring them somewhere else, when it's not exactly your route, no driver will do that for 50 cents because we are in the real cost sharing space. It would have to be hyper local going to, it would have to be my neighbor who I would never have known works at the building next to me. Yes, and then you, you, exactly. You do that on a regular basis, but not occasional when you have to meet and you have to meet new people and you have to, uh, uh, to drop them off somewhere else. So in this activity, there is a demand. Clearly, there is a demand from passengers to move around for short distances, but there is no offer in the ride-sharing mode yeah. like we do because the, the, uh, the, the cost-sharing model doesn't work. The cost-sharing model is not an incentive for drivers to share on short, on very short distances. And and so similarly, looking at Drivey, I mean, there's 
you guys are going to be expanding into new markets, I hope, in the coming, in the coming 18 months. Uh, do you look at these sort of parallel avenues of, of growth, uh, things like rental agencies and things like that? Do you look at these sort of similar models or even the models you're disrupting and look at how you can uh, jump in there? Or, or are you guys, is, is, you know, are you focused on this one avenue right now? So, so we do two things, expand internationally and, and try to change the product all the time. And basically today our, our business is to do rentals of three days booked 40, 48 hours in advance. And we want to do uh, rentals of just a few hours booked 30 minutes in advance. So we are going to increase the flexibility, the last minute uh, possibilities of drivey by reducing the friction uh, in the booking process and the check-in and check-out process. So something we just did last week, for example, is instead of having a pay signing a paper contract when you, when you take the car, uh, it's all on the mobile and you can sign on the iPhone of the, of the owner. So that's a, a one example of reducing friction and, and being able to go uh, for just rental of a few hours. If, if we can do frictionless rentals of a few hours, it means instead of just doing occasional trips, we can really be a competitor for the, for the weekly use, I would say, weekend use. It means really replacing car ownership and, and not just being there when you have a wedding lost in the, in the countryside. And, and so essentially what you, need, you want to get to a point where you're as frictionless as Autolib is in Paris, where, which even isn't perfect at this point, but you want to be at a point where I just see a car, I can go to it, I can get in and I can drive and it doesn't matter who owns it. I, it's definitely the objective. Since the beginning, even uh, when, when I started Drivey five, five years ago, this was the objective, but we had to go to a, a route to, to, to go there, and it's definitely what we want to do, uh, frictionless uh, rentals. And, uh, and we might have some, some cars in the city of Paris uh, that, that will operate in, in a way close to Autolib quite soon. How do you guys really quickly, we only have a, a few minutes left, so, so the last question is, how do you guys approach competition as you grow? You guys have had a great strategy, which is competition equals our next market. Um, uh, sort of this acqui-hire uh, expansion. Um, but we, we talked a while ago, I think it was last year, about people uh, bouncing back on your payment model and, and opening these sort of free rideshare program. How, how do you guys deal with competition uh, within your market or, or looking at them in other markets and considering where you guys are going to butt heads first? So, yeah, uh, two, two things for expansion and for uh, the value in your product. For expansion, uh, yeah, we see uh, any, any company which has started ride sharing in a country as really partners we should partner with because they've done a, usually a tremendous job and we should partner with them because we will all grow faster. Uh, when we when we make a deal with a local partner, uh, like we've done like six or seven times now, when we expand, we actually um, offer them not only, uh, of course, money to develop better, but also we uh, arrive with a product, with a customer support, with a brand, with positioning, with methods for growing, which accelerate growth in a, in a tremendous way. And so the teams we're, which we, which with whom we are partnering are actually uh, teams of people who are exceptional, they know the culture, they know the field, they are motivated for ride sharing. So it's really an advantage for us to partner with them. That's how we've been growing so fast thanks to those local teams which are amazing people and, and they helped us grow. The next thing about uh, the value in the product, it's all, a, it's all a matter of value in the product in the end. If people don't understand why they should pay two or three euros for a service, it's because they don't see the value in it. So you have to explain them that the value is that it's reliable, you know with whom you'll be going, you know that someone who has booked in your car will be coming. You don't have to spend like 15 or 20 phone calls to make sure that at least two or three people will be in your car. We have a booking system that allows you to actually only get the two or three people out of the 15 who would have called you who will actually come. And this value, you have to explain it because at the beginning we had a, uh, the, the, the remarks were like, yeah, but I used to have like 15 phone calls and now I only get two or three people uh, booking in my car. And you're like, yeah, but there are the two or three good ones. <laughs> So that's what you want because if you have if you spend like 12 phone calls with people who will never show up, 
then you lost your time. So that's the value. And then 12 phone calls of two minutes, uh, it's 24 minutes. And then uh, it's uh, your mobile, um, your mobile plan is also having troubles because you pay too much. So that it was two or three euros. And then once you explain that, uh, they're like, okay. Uh, so last word, Paulon. How do you guys approach uh, market expansion with respect to competitors? Do you guys, you know, do you try to identify, okay, we've got someone here, we're probably going to butt heads with them. Let's make the let's take the fight to them. How do, you, how do you guys approach that? What's your reflection? Well, we are very pragmatic. So when we look at a new country, we are looking at who is operating there. Can we join forces or not? Uh, and then if we can't, we do it ourselves. And if we can, we... And, and uh, yeah, I, I think some, uh, we have some nice projects in the pipeline. So I think we'll... Uh, We'll be able to announce some good things. Uh, I'm going to get. I'm going to so. get an email from you at some point. Of course. <laughs> awesome. That's all I want. That's all I live for. Um, oh, really quick. Both. Uh, I know we, we got to run. Uh, when you acquire a local entity, you said you did it six or seven times. Do they have local incentives? If they get to a million users, there's some sort of. Uh, cash out, you can just say, I can't tell you if you can't, but I'm really curious to know. No, well, what we do is that everybody is part of the same company. So actually what we do when we do this is that the company in the country becomes part of blah blah car and we are all in the same boat which means that when Poland is super uh, like it's performing a lot Spain is really happy and they're like yes you made a great job and then when uh, Italy is doing super well then India is super happy and so we are all the same team and all motivated by the same goal growing everywhere we can and bring this ride sharing service to the entire planet and I imagine that goes very similar with your plans coming down yeah, the road. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, 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 don't, we, don't have, uh, we don't motivate like, the management of a new country with uh, only local objectives. Yeah. They, are part, I mean, they are incentivized on, on, the, on the success of the whole group. Very cool. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for taking the time to chat. Uh, I wish you the best in the coming months. Uh, new markets, new fun, new users. So uh, good luck. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time to chat. Uh, I'm hungry. You're hungry. Let's get lunch. And we'll see you at 2. Thank you.